So the format here is that Lucas is going to share her story for a little while, and we're going to throw really hard and funny questions at her and see what kind of intel we can pull from her brain. Because she's had a lot of experience in starting businesses and running businesses. Uh, last week we had John Bacino, former now innovator at large in the wild, unfettered by anybody else and doing really interesting things. Uh, next week, who we got? Josh David. Josh David, who's the CEO of Sedvi, which is um, an iPad-based marketing materials distribution platform. I saw a demo of it, it's really cool, and those, that phrase really doesn't do it justice. Um, this Wednesday, we have a demo of Mixset at Night Owls. That's Wednesday nights from 7 to 10. We always do an event on Wednesday nights, too. Mixset is some attempt to revisit the uh, mixtape. For those of you who have gray hair, like me, you remember the mixtape? Uh, I don't know what, yeah. what that's going to be about. but. Thursday, the Liberty Valley Initiative, which is um, a group of technologists in the King of Prussia area, they are doing an event here with the CEO of Saxby's Coffee. So evidently, Saxby's you know, had a trajectory like this, and then like this, and then like this, and so this, we're going to talk to them right here. So that should be interesting. What else? Uh, next week, we have high school box views. So we're doing this thing every other week at Night Owls where we, uh, where we provide free education on interesting things. So we did, Wilhelm did Flask, a Python framework, recently, last week. And next week, our advisor, Andrew Schwab, who's the founder of multiple companies, great guy, he's going to do an intro to BoxViews and uh, Shippable. It's this framework for uh, continuous deployment of code. So not an entry level thing, but it's about an hour and there will be a little demo. Uh, there's plenty of sticks back there from them. It's a German company. So if you know of anything about Docker containers, you'd be interested. And we're just getting our feet wet in that area. We'd like to really do more training. And so if you have ideas about that and want to share, let me know. Uh, we're thinking of also doing a mobile boot camp, iOS and Android. And we have a 3D printer bootcamp coming up. We're just half sold out on that. You can find out more information on our site. If you want to come in here, hang out with Chad, <coughs> build a printer from scratch, and then walk home with it, that's what you get. So, uh, what's that? And you learn how to use it. And you learn how to use it. It doesn't become like a sewing machine. It's right. your closet. Um, we're getting into IoT too. You know, we just don't want to be printing awesome-looking owls and turtles. Um, so uh, we're connecting stuff to the internet, taking pictures and tweeting it, and sending a postcard to your house all at once. So connecting everything. Um, ben, anything else? Uh, you pretty much covered it. I think we're uh, maybe did we mention our sponsors? And yeah. So all the Street Labs has got here because of people like you coming to give us a reason to be here. And, uh, uh, Chester County Economic Development Council uh, came in early and saw what we were doing and liked it. So they put this up with some grants that uh, paid for a lot of this. Mr. Igniter TV over there, aka Sean Dominski, doing the live stream so that all of these presentations are on our YouTube channel. Mike and Jaron do the shorter form media. And so if you see the stuff coming through your, your channels, please share it. Uh, Fox Rothschild has been doing all the legal for us, pro bono, cooking us up big time for our incubator. And Brennan's, Hankin, Goshen Group, lots of other folks um, making this happen. So it's a community affair. Thank you for coming. I see a lot of new faces. And let's give you a round of applause. And, uh, so what I thought I'd do this morning, um, because I, because it's easy and because I don't really know, I didn't have a sense of what the audience here was going to be like, is to tell my story uh, relatively quickly 
and then open it up for questions. So the goal of the story is just to provide you context for the kind of things that I know about, can talk about, have, have experienced. Um, I'm one of a pretty small group of Philadelphia serial entrepreneurs, so I've done a whole array of companies. Um, I grew up in New York City and came down here to go to college and had no idea what I wanted to do in my life. I was pretty undirected. My parents are artists. Um, business never occurred to me even. Uh, and I did, I answered a, a uh, ad in the classified section of the Philadelphia Inquirer. This I graduated in college in 1985, so this is way pre-internet, um, for a secretary to a vice president of sales. And I got the job that it was for the Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia office of a San Francisco-based startup called Automated Call Processing. And so 85 was long before anybody even knew what a startup was, right? We were about, I think I was employee number 12. Um, and within about six months there, I had my first p and um, And that's not because I did anything special. It was just because I was willing and the business was growing and somebody had to do it. So sure, that 23-year-old can do that. And then I, um, I stayed there for four years. I ultimately moved to San, in, back to New York and then to San Francisco for them and still had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Didn't have any context at all. Um, and when I mean no context, it's actually hard looking back to even get yourself in that headspace. I didn't understand, I didn't know that you know Procter & Gamble existed and owned all those brands. I didn't know what an auditor was. I didn't know anything. But what I did know, somebody said to me, I ended up, I ended up going to Wharton. Um, and an admissions officer said there that I was an unusual type of applicant because I was a dirt under the fingernails business person. In other words, I actually knew how to make money, but I didn't have any of the context. So I went, so I went to business school and I really only intended to take a couple of years and <coughs> relax. Um, I'd applied to PhD programs in art history, which is sort of a real love of mine, and psychology because that's what my undergrad was. And the truth is my undergrad was in psych because it was easy and I played basketball, which is a very demanding sport. Um, so I was really just banging around. And the reason I, I focus on that is I look out there and there's not that many really young folks in this, in this audience. There's a couple, but there's also a bunch of you who look to be about my age like you have kids. And I think one of the things that we're really doing a disservice to kids these days is like, you know, you should know by your 12 what you want to do with your life. And who the hell knows? You have no idea, right? So I sort of banged around and when I back, went back to business school, I had an experience that I think is really rare in business school, is that it was truly transformational for me. I was just amazed. Um, I'd been sort of a, you know, sort of quasi-intellectual, and the fact that there was actually an intellect, there was that there was an academic underpinning for how you approached business. The idea of a net present value to me was just an amazing thing. And so I graduated in '91, again way before the whole startup thing happened. But I knew I wanted to do a startup, and I'd figured out when I was at business school that what I really wanted to do was was run startups. <laughs> Um, mostly because it was this nice mix. It's a, I'm people. And I'd figured out, really through business school, not at all by myself, that that is the critical success skill for, to be a leader, right? Is it's really all about people. And, and if you can understand the things they're doing, that's really helpful. But the goal is to hire people who are great at things. Um, couldn't find one of those in Philadelphia. So I ended up going, which I'm really happy it ended up happening to SEI Investments. If people are familiar with that, it's, a, it's an Oaks-based company. It was founded in 68 by another Wharton alum. He's still running it and myself and, and all the rest. So that was great. Um, and then um, very early, one of the developers there, it's a technology-based company, um, showed me the World Wide Web. And I can't claim to be visionary at all. That's really not my strength. Um, but I saw this thing, and I'll tell you exactly what he showed me. He showed me a site that somebody had put up of subway maps around the world. And you could see the London tube and the Parisian, and it was instantly clear to me that something was completely different, right? This is in the era of AOL and CompuServe, and I just kept asking questions like, who is this guy? Where is that thing? How did he do that? Right? This is when the web was literally brand new, and I just thought, I, I have to go do that. So I did a bunch of projects inside, in, inside, um, inside SEI to try to get the internet going, but the reality was nobody, nobody cared, right? We were servicing large banks and they didn't care. And then I got a phone call from a headhunter, um, actually through Chris Brookmeyer introduced me to, to, to her, uh, for a head of a product management at a little uh, company called Infonautics. 
And Infonautics is known locally and is really an important company locally. It was a, we took it public in, uh, in August of 96, so it was one of the earliest internet company IPOs, local company. And, and uh, Philadelphia Business Journal at one point did this great chart showing um, the heredity of the Philadelphia startup scene, and it's amazing. Like 80% of us have ha had some connection back to Infonautics, and we can talk about that if you'd like, sort of how, how startup environments happen, and, and Philadelphia's light years from where it was, although still we have a long way to go. So I went there as head of product management. Um, I joined, I was about employed 30. We grew 150 in six months. Um, went public, IPO was a disaster, so I lived through this whole thing. And then I got a phone call from a friend uh, who was an old SEI friend who was on the board of a company called Destiny Software. And Destiny Software was two guys, they were in Elverson, Pennsylvania, uh, which is in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania, and um, they were doing online banking. Uh, they had done, they'd built uh, the Vanguard Group's online banking system on AOL, which we think was the first actual consumer transaction system online where you could actually make trades. Um, that was a consulting gig, and then they had closed right before I met them um, a deal with the Bank of America to build their online banking platform on, on AOL and had managed to, to work a deal where they were going to retain IP rights to the system. So then they could theoretically, you know, we could sell it to multiple. So they called because um, the board of the company, so it's these two guys, the board was the mom and dad of the founder, he was a school teacher, she was a homemaker, and this friend of mine from SEI who knew nothing about any of this stuff, and they were looking for a marketing person. And so I went and met with them and I was, what was I, I don't know, I was 32 maybe, and um, I said, I think this is amazing, clearly this online banking this, this stuff is going to go crazy, this is great that you have this great anchor, I would love to come be your marketing person, but you need a CEO. And the founder, Skip Shooter, said to me, well, what does, that, you know, what does that mean, what do you need? And I said, well, you have to take the company public and raise capital and all this stuff that I hadn't done, and I left thinking, wow, I really hope they find somebody and get some money because I'd love to go work for those guys and really get on the down, ground floor. And in the key turning point of my career, um, in a lot of ways my life, Skip called me that Monday, this was a Saturday we met, and said, I was at work, and he said, we agree with you, we really do need a CEO, and we'd like you to come do it. Um, which literally had not crossed my mind. And I ch sort of got my chin back up off my chest, and I said, Okay, um, and I think an important thing I should have said when I, when I moved from SEI to Infodonics, I was making a lot of money at SEI, um, really successful there. I took about a 50% pay cut to move to Infodonics and then another 50% plus pay cut to move to Destiny. And one of the things that says is, especially again for younger folks, is you need to keep, if you want to do this thing, you need to keep yourself in a personal situation where you can do that. Right, I never scaled my lifestyle up to reflect my income, and so when I needed to do that, I wanted to do that. Right, money to me is just money, um, or you can do that because you don't spend a lot of money. And so I'd managed that. So I went and joined this company, um, which was still. I look back. I think I was. I think I did a better job there than at any company I've worked at. It was an extraordinary. It was an extraordinary place. It really was. Um, we ended up getting. We we were we were number 32 on the Inc. 500. We were the second fastest growing. Private, we were second fastest growing profitable company in the United States. Um, it was, it mostly it was just an amazing place. It was an amazing place for clients. Um, and then there's a long story, which I can tell if someone asks about it. We ended up um, really strangely um, dissolving the company, despite the fact that we had about $10 million of cash in the bank, um, driven, by, driven by our investors uh, after the bubble burst. So those of you who remember the bubble bursting and then 9-11, um, it was, it was really rough if you were in tech at that time. It was really rough. Um, so left there. I was six months pregnant. I'd had uh, uh, with my second daughter, and not six months pregnant. Guys, you probably can't relate. It's not really a prime like job seeking status for the CEO. Yeah, sure, come in and run my company, and then I'll lose you for however long. Um, and I then, you know, I look back and it's probably great for me individually what happened with Destiny because I ended up, um, there's a guy uh, named Vince Gavoni who we'd both had money from Safeguard 
uh, venture funds, and so we knew each other. We weren't, you know, we knew each other sort of that way. We were friendly in the way you get to be as CEOs in the same portfolio. They have, for those of you who don't know, venture guys. They have these, they have conferences and things where they bring together the CEOs, and you learn from each other. And they have speakers and stuff. So Vincent and I knew each other. He had a new company called the e Privacy Group, with um, what I thought was really about the worst idea on earth: paid priority email. The idea was sort of AdWords for your inbox, so you, so advertisers could pay to get a slot in your inbox. Um, but he was, he was looking for an operator, and I'm, I'm sort of more of an operator than I am a founder, although I founded a bunch of companies. Um, and so I went out to talk to them, and I told them I thought that was a terrible idea, but when they were developing that technology, they had come up with um, a guy named Dave Brusen, uh, K, who's, who's extraordinary, had come up with this idea for how to solve spam in a completely different uh, technical way than anybody else had. So really briefly, what spam, what every other spam solution does is they look at each message and filter it. So they decide this one's good, I'll pass it along, that was this one's spam, I'll put it over here and, and hold on to it just in case. Um, and that's done at the application layer, right? So the messages come, your software does that either at the server side or actually on your, on your uh, desktop. What we did was we had a router, so we actually sat way down in the architecture and the network and assessed the likelihood that each message was spam, which is actually a really hard problem. That's technically a really hard problem. But what we did was amass the likelihood that all the messages were spam and, and use those to assess how likely a sender was to be a spammer. So that if 80% of the messages that we're getting from you look like spam, it's really likely you're a spam cannon. And when you see that, we just tightened up the network connection for those that look spammy. So we still let a little bit through, we tightened it up. What happened then is, is spammers, spam cannons as they're called, are programmed to abandon slow connections. So all of a sudden we looked like you were, you know, Merck was a customer. Merck looked like they were on a 300 baud modem to a spammer. And the software automatically abandons them. So we dropped, spam was just unbelievable, this is 2003, a huge problem. Um, we dropped network traffic by 90% at places like Merck and Edward Jones Brokerage. Um, so they're this great idea, but it's trapped in this horrific company, which also was a mess from a cap table standpoint and all the rest. Um, Josh Koppelman, if people don't know Josh, he certainly should around here, is founded first round. I worked for Josh when, at Infonautics. His grandfather was the seed investor at Destiny. And I called Josh as a friend and a mentor. I, I, I think he would have at that time said the same about me. And I called him and said, you know, I'm, here I am, I'm having this baby. I just had this essentially financial failure. I like need to figure out what to do with my life. I had a job offer from Fiberlink to run product for them. And I called Josh and say like, not as an investor, he wasn't investing yet at that time. Um, I just said like, what should, I gotta decide what to do with my life. So I have this wacky anti-spam thing over here that's a complete mess. I'd have to create a new co and buy the IP and all kinds of complicated stuff or I have this job. Um, and he said to me, I'm sitting here telling myself, kicking myself, saying, don't tell her you'll invest, don't tell her you'll invest. And I said, you'll invest? He said, well, maybe. And so we, on that phone call, created a concept, which we then executed. We took, we, I created a new co with Dave Bruce. So we'll come back into this story again. And I think another theme here is this heredity thing, right? All these connections that happen over time, as long as you just do the right thing, just keep doing the right thing. Um, and so we created a new co, David and I, the, the, the uh, inventor and I. We didn't have any cash. This is another part of the story. You don't have to have cash to do this. We bought the technology out, just basically a, a, a patent application, um, and a couple guys who were building a prototype. We bought that with stock from the company, and then Josh put a first round of funding in. Um, we ended up raising $700,000, and we sold the company to Symantec six months later for 28 million bucks. It was um, an amazing story, um, and I can talk about that and sort of how that happened if you'd like to hear more. So we did that, and then, like, okay, there's the life-changing event. You can do whatever you want. And you know what I did? I, you know, it was really funny, actually, at that time, because I was traveling a lot and, and spending my time also in California trying to sew to do. And here, the consistent question I got, so this is 2004, um, why are you doing anything? Like, what do you, in California, the consistent question was, what are you doing next? 
And I think that's one of the things here that needs to shift, right, is what are you doing next? I'm doing this because this is what I love to do. So I then uh, co-founded a company called Cuts.com that was a video editing platform. Um, it still exists. Rift Tracks, um, which is the Mystery Science 3000 people, bought um, this company. But it was, uh, we, we thought the founder was um, Sonny Baljapali, who was Josh Koppelman's co-founder at Half.com. Again, right, all these things go through. Um, so we founded it. Um, we thought it needed to be a West Coast company, and at that time it probably did, but we hired the wrong CEO, and he couldn't raise money. So we sold it in uh, what's called a soft landing. So basically you find employment for all the people, you find a home for the technology, nobody makes any money. Um, so that, that, ha that was like a year plus. Um, and along that, the t along that way, I had become enamored which looking back was a big mistake, but I'd become enamored with online advertising. And I had because I like, I like markets that are, that are large, but where there's significant disruption happening, where everything's changing. It was really clear that was happening in online advertising at that time. Right? So now we're in sort of 2005, 2006. And so I was looking at all kinds of things. I interimed as CEO at a couple of places. I just couldn't find a thing I really liked. And meanwhile, the uh, guys at Internet Capital Group, who they've renamed themselves something else now, but I knew them back again from Destiny Days and all that. Um, and actually from, I knew them even from SEI because SEI owned a company that Doug Alexander, one of the partners there, had founded. And, you know, Philly's small, but this is the way this whole world works. So I was talking to him and he said, you know, there's this, there's this guy, Craig Danieloff, who was a guy who had had a, a number of venture-backed startups in, he lives, he lives up in Doylestown area. Um, he really knows a ton about this online advertising stuff. You know how to scale companies. Why don't you guys just do a services company? We'll fund it with the specific goal of um, creating, a f of finding a product opportunity there. And so we did that. So I forget when exactly, but we founded a company originally called um, Commerce 360. Um, Josh came in again, so we had a, a number of really great angels that came in, and they came in. We didn't need the money. We were actually profitable. We did about two million bucks in our first year and were profitable, but we had them there as placeholders so that when we found the product opportunity, we could blow it out. And that's what happened. So we decided um, on paid search, if everyone remembers when AdWords was new, we built a system that enabled large advertisers and large agencies to manage paid search advertising. And indeed, all those guys came in. Um, yeah, as, as that company grew, um, we ended up, we had to raise money in 2009, which if anybody is old enough or lived through 2009, that was really rough. We did end up raising it, but it was really rough. And um, we got really diluted. And the truth is, I don't really like advertising. So I like the idea of the optimization and all the rest of that, but I, my, my uh, younger daughter was, how old would she have been? She's like four or five. And she's sort of a systems thinker. So we're in the kitchen and she's sitting at our, at our uh, we had this huge butcher block top thing. And she's sitting there and she starts asking me what, what we do and in detail, right? And I'm going through and she looks at me. She has this heavy brow, kind of like I do. She comes down and she goes, but mommy, isn't that advertising? And don't you hate advertising? And it's one of those moments you just sort of go like, oh fuck, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And we'd been diluted, and we were number three in the market. There'd been like 20 plus, so it was great we were number three, but the two key competitors who had both gone on to be super successful had raised 55 million. We'd only raised 15. We were gonna have to go raise that kind of money. And we just looked at each other and just said, we don't, let's not do this. So we sold the company. Um, we sold, we did a competitive whole thing with bankers and all the rest of that and sold it. Um, and then, I was kicking around again, and I do have this nice history. Every one of these so far that I've mentioned, it's always June. So there's a while there where my girls thought that I like got summers off, because that was how that worked. Um, so I was kicking around, um, and I had seen this movie, which is a whole other vein we can talk about, and I, it's probably dangerous too, because I go on about it endlessly. Um, I saw this movie, Forks Over Knives. And my one brief, I'll keep it to 30 second commercial, is if you haven't seen um, that film or if you don't know about um, the power of, of 
food in your life, um, go watch it. So I see this movie, Forks Over Knives. It's about eating a whole food plant-based diet and the medical impact of that, physical impact of that. And I, I saw it, and I was pretty knowledgeable. I'm an athlete. I'm still a competitive athlete. I've been an athlete my whole life. And I just thought, that can't be true. I don't know. That can't be right. But the studies that they cite are like from, they're done in the Cleveland Clinic and Harvard. And they're published in Nature and Science and the New England Journal of Medicine. And so I went and read the stuff. I went back to the source and read the stuff. And it, uh, it's true, A. Um, and B, it made me really angry. It made me really politically angry that I didn't know that. And you start to understand all the political, it's basically the military industrial complex and food. So you look at big food and processed, so big, big pharma, big agriculture, processed food, and it's what's making us all sick. It's why we have diabetes and the crazy rates of heart disease and cancer and all the rest. So I changed, after having done this research, I changed the way I ate and um, had a, a miraculous experience. So I was really super healthy, but I'm really arthritic from all these years and, and knees and, and shoulders and things. I was to the point where um, knee, uh, knee replacement was the only thing left, and I'm really too young because they'd have to do like four of them before hopefully I live a long time before I die. And so I went from literally having to pull myself up a banister in a stairway to being pain-free. I'm really pain-free in like three weeks. And I just thought like, I, I, I. and then I have a very overweight friend who um, he's like a big guy who had really high cholesterol. And I talked him into trying it. And he did it not quite as wholeheartedly as I did. And is off all statins and dropped 70 pounds. And I was like, OK. I can't, like, there has to be a way to help people do this. And what I'd seen over and over again was the, the problem with eating isn't so much education. Because even if you don't go sort of to the extreme that you'd see in that movie, you're just improving. Like just eat a huge thing of greens every day has such an impact. But people don't do it. And it's not that they don't know they should. I actually think it's sort of it's so, it's social. And it's also just really hard. So I went about how do we solve this problem? Right? And I, I, I had this idea. Um, I had a lunch out at Shangri-La, right, on 202, opposite uh, over there by King of Prussia. I guess it's in Wayne, actually. And it was empty. It was a Tuesday. It was empty. And I was driving back. I was borrowing uh, office space at Monetate, which will be the last leg of the story in a minute. Um, I was driving back, and it just occurred to me, wait a second. They already paid for the kitchen. They have all this staff that's essentially just standing around waiting for dinner. They have great culinary expertise. Why couldn't I teach them how to cook healthy food and then use that as supply chain for meal delivery? And so I founded this company called Real Food Works, um, which uh, is still kicking. We're, we, like, we just, this week actually today, we're sending an email. We're launching um, a huge campaign with with Forks Over Knives, with the movie guys. Um, we have 17,000 people on a list to sign up for our meal delivery service. So that's what we do. We use the excess capacity and existing food infrastructure to create home delivered, fresh, super healthy meals. Um, and we've had thousands of customers at this point. Um, we. Uh, you know, it's incredibly gratifying. You get, it's, it's great to grow a business and create revenue and, and make money and all that. But boy, you get an email from someone about my brother, you know, had his leg amputated from diabetes and I've been on your food for six weeks and my sugar levels are, I'm having to go to the doctor to get off my insulin because my sugar levels are normal. You're just like, oh man, you know, how do you change that? So. I'm doing that. It was funded. It, it was very difficult company to fund. Um, it's food. Everyone thinks food sucks. All my all my tech friends thought I was insane. Um, I ended up raising money a little a little bit from angels because they were very mission, you know mission driven angels, and a lot because it was just me, right? And I called in every chit. I'd made a lot of money for people, and um, I just called in every chit. You know, I had one investor say to me, so you, you have three free passes. You've used one. Is this, is this one? Are you going to, yeah, I'm going to use it here. So we funded it and ran it at first like a venture-backed startup. It took us a couple real years to realize that was really dumb and the wrong way to do it, that in fact it's a cash flow business like most food businesses. Um, it's not super scalable. And so we were right about there trying to figure out how exactly to make it work and how to grow it when Monetate, um, rear, came along. So Monetate is a Conchi-based company. It's seven years old. 
Um, the founders are two David, David Brusen, who is my co-founder at Turntide, and David Bookspan. I had introduced the two of them. David Brusen, when we sold to Symantec, went and worked there for a number of years, had kicked out and was figuring out new things to do. Um, he's more technical. He wanted a more sales-oriented partner. So I introduced the two of them. They founded Monetate and asked me to join them as the outside director. So the three of us have been with the company since founding. Um, David had done an amazing job. David Brusen, Bookspan had left operations along the way. David Brusen had done an amazing job growing the company. Um, it had gotten to the stage where it needed to enter a next generation that was more go-to-market focused, more about scale and all this sort of stuff. And so the board, of which I, I'm still a member, actually, I was on the search committee. Um, the board, David suggested, and we went forward with, with hiring a new, um, bringing in a new CEO. And um, but David's still very active in the business, but someone else running it. And um, David asked me to do it. And the board did this full, so I dropped off the search committee, obviously, and um, ended up in an amazing sort of timing and um, luck favors the prepared kind of situation, joining Monetate as CEO almost exactly a year ago um, and transitioning the management of Real Food Works to the guy who had been our COO is now our president. Um, so I'm very involved there still. I'm on the board and, and work deals and all the rest. But uh, he runs that business day to day in more of a cash flow oriented normal way. We've moved into sound lands down now. Um, and then I've been running Monetate for the last year plus. Um, so Monetate's a couple hundred people. Um, we have our main offices are in Kanchi. We have an office in Palo Alto and another in London. And people, my management team is spread all over the place. So I can also talk about how do you manage a large enterprise SaaS company. And that's where I am. So hopefully, um, you know, Real Food Works, I think, is about to is about to take off and make, make itself, which is, which is just awesome. Um, Monetate is a whole new challenge um, for me, so that's been really fun. The international part is fun, and just the scale. It, it, and, and, the, and it's very different to come into something that you didn't build yourself. Really different. It's a whole new set of um, lessons for me. So that's the story uh, until now. If you look forward, um, I, you know, I'm 52. I really love this. I don't have, I, I, it's really funny to watch my friends of my similar age. Um, there's some small percentage of us who are still really completely engaged in what we do professionally and driving. There's another set that are super engaged doing something different. So they sort of have a day job, but they're really into teaching yoga or whatever their thing is. And then there's a whole bunch of them who, the largest proportion, who are sort of got on cruise control. Um, and that's, I don't, I never, haven't been on cruise control. I gave up, my mother brings up often, if I complain about my daughters, that I gave up napping before I was a year old um, and really haven't looked back since. So I'm not going to kick back and be the, one of those last groups. I think probably, it depends on how long it takes us at Monetate to get where we want to go. It may be my last CEO thing. Um, I have a real passion around teaching CEOs. I'd really like to do, I'd really like to do kind of CEO school. Um, there's a, there's a real, um, there's an actual discipline to it. There are things you need to know how to do, and there are, there's very clear phases and cycles as companies grow, and it's done a lot of times really badly. Um, and it's a really hard to, job to learn. It's a really hard job to learn. Board members mostly, especially in venture back, they've never done it, most of them. They don't know what to teach you, and you're leading usually people who are doing their thing for the first time. So I think um, that I may end up doing something with that in addition to whatever board stuff you know, I'll keep doing. I'm actually not on any other board right at the moment. i got too much going on. Really, I'm on one or two boards in addition to what I do, plus not-for-profit stuff. So we'll see what the next thing holds. But for the next probably five years or so, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. So with all that, right, if you go back, I can talk about food endlessly. I, we, can, we can talk about early stages and how you get going and um, how you fund and how you staff and that sort of thing. Um, we can talk about scaling. Um, we can talk about sort of what's interesting that's happening in tech. We talk about Philly tech scene. I'm happy to um, opine on anything that people are interested in. So who has a question? Okay. So house rules for Q&A. Tell us your name, something like Super special about you. Yeah, um, you're first. Oh, boy. And then your question. Okay. She wouldn't have raised her hand so fast I if she knew she had to do all that. Jen Weir Smith. Um, when I first started coming here, I was at QVC for 10 years. I'm now oh. at Bridal. We're neighbors. But we're neighbors and, and both of those clients. Absolutely. You solve everything. Exactly. For us. We're <laughs> thrilled to hear that. However, I want to go to the food question. Okay. Um, I'm a 
Yeah. Because um, my husband and I had gone into doing uh, the third year, moving and everything, and, and yep. uh, it is a big, big deal to get back on it. How do you, what are your children like with this type of eating, and were you able to influence them? Because we have two young ones, too. How old are they? They are five and eight. Oh, you're in great shape. You're in great shape. So the question was, with the food thing, how do you deal with kids? Um, so my daughters are 15 and 12. So when I switched, they were like 6 and 11. My little daughter is an ethical vegan. So I eat vegan. I don't eat any, any animal products. She's an actual, genuine ethical vegan. We were sitting at uh, dinner at a friend's when she was like 5. And there were chicken fajitas. And somebody said, like, pass me the chicken. And she said, leans over to me and says, that's chicken? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, that's chicken. And you know, you disappear, those parents in the room know when, like, mm -hmm. this kid is about to say something that's not going to be comfortable. <laughs> and she said, it's dead chicken? <laughs> yep. And she said, it used to be live chicken? Yep, and she turned vegetarian, literally. Like, she then took her a couple months to learn that bacon was a pig, and as she learned, that was it. And then we were at a dairy, we were at Mary Mead Dairy Farm, and she saw cows being automated, um, you know, milked, well, and she turned. So she was pretty easy, um, and she was little. Emma, my older one, has probably extraordinarily healthy diet for her peer group, but relative to the family, she's not. So they both eat... Um, you know, basically what I do is I never, I think you don't ever tell your kids, as soon as you start to get didactic about it, you're screwed. So it's just what we have in the house. It's what I cook. And so they go out and they eat whatever they eat outside. My older one's at boarding school um, and makes amazing food choices, again, relative to her peers. But she's not um, purist. She knows, though. I mean, it's extraordinary how much they know about it. So the key is just what you do in the house and then not be too, I'm just not overbearing about it. Who's next? Hi, my name is Sabrina, I'm a CPA. Um, and I have several clients who are kind of in that startup phase. You had mentioned something about uh, CEOs, they often they, when they have a company, I guess that could be scalable, they do, they do things wrong. What's, what's the most common mistake that you see these new CEOs make? Um, the most common mistakes, especially now that so many entrepreneurs are so young, um, are people mistakes. They don't manage people well. The, 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 the basic rules of management don't go out the door just because you're in a startup world. And I think people make all these assumptions about what people should want and how they want to be treated and all the rest uh, based on startup. This is not true. They, people are built, we're all human and we need a set of things. And whether you're in QVC or at a two-person startup, you still basically need the care and feeding. So I think that's the single biggest mistake. Related really closely to that is they make bad choices around people. And, and in particular, you tend to, if you haven't lived through the cycle, um, it's funny, I had a call with an entrepreneur when I was driving over here, or very early for me this morning. Um, and she was talking about, the last time I talked to her was probably nine months ago, and she had this plan about what was going to get done in four months and all the rest. And of course, it took her twice as long, and it cost her twice as much which is what everybody had told her, and she thought, no, it's not me. Not, yeah, you. It's going to cost you twice as much. So if you haven't actually lived through that, so what I do is I get to that point where I think, like, this is really what it's going to take. This, I can't imagine possibly that it was going to take, and then I double it anyway. And um, if you don't do that, you can end up really getting yourself in trouble because you, you run out of money. Um, so I think that's the, you know, and related to that, you make the people tie to that is, you make, um, because you feel almost, too, you feel really too much of a sense of urgency, you make short-term people decisions. You know, you get that person on even though they're not quite right because you feel so pressured to get the person on. Never the right answer, ever. You have to wait for the right person. So I think people issues are the set that I see people screw up most often. I saw in the New York Times, they did a little interview with Sam Altman, who runs Y Combinator, and he said, what do you look for in a founder? Uh, someone who's stubborn, uh, who changes their mind, but not too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always say that it's funny. I didn't, I didn't read that, but one of the things I've been saying for 20 years is being doing what I do takes a really unusual combination of complete hard-headedness with open-mindedness. Right. So you have to be really 
focused and driven, because otherwise you get all over the place. But you do have to have this ability to go, hmm, I think I was wrong. And change. And change. In the back, what's your name? Hi, I'm Eva. Um, and my question is that we said a uh, jack of all trades, master of none. Um, no, well, as a young person, but just as a career, how's you, how have you sold that as an asset to a team? Because I feel like people are like, well, we're not sure what you can do here, but it's like you can do a little bit of everything to get lost in the. So I guess I have to back up. You, you know, the found the. the uh, uh, Presumption underneath that is one that is candidly foreign to me. I know that it's how things happen um, now. I maybe always did. I just, that worldview is, for, is just not how I think about things. It would never occur to me to have to sell myself. I wouldn't try to sell myself. When I was early in my career, I just sort of did things. I wasn't trying to create. I mean, you heard, like, that's why I shared that randomness of my early path. I wasn't trying to do anything. I was just like a basically competent, smart person, and I was in this environment, and that looked like the right thing to do, so I just did that. And my experience all the way through SEI, right, um, through pretty senior, I was running pretty decent-sized organizations there, was if you just sort of do that, the rest takes care of itself. So I don't, I don't, um, I think if you're good, maybe if you're not good, it doesn't work, but if you're good, you just keep being good. People want people who are good. You don't have to sort of manage it or try to get this. Now, if you want to be a doctor, obviously, you have to go to medical school. You have to do a set of things. But in what we do, nobody cares. I don't care where you went to school or if you went to school at all. Or what. I just want someone who's good. So just be good. If you're just good, then it all, it all sort of works out at the end of the day. Um, so I don't know how to answer the question because I don't really think about it that way, right? What you're gonna, it's all about results at the end of the day. And so if being a jack of all trades is about results, then that's what you sell, is I'm gonna get it done. Um, John, can I ask you to ask a question or comment? <laughs> John's from Gore, and I learned that Gore has a lattice uh, structure that seems to have yeah, Gore is really all, cool. all this uh, innovation. So uh, is there something that you could say to prompt Talk about uh, building innovation off uh, in an organization. You put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on no the spot. Why shouldn't you be? Yeah. Um, how did, how did, a lot of the, what you talked about was connections. And um, how, do you, how did you manage to keep all these connections together? Like every time you move, you seem to have. Yeah, they follow me around. They follow you. Yeah. So. Um, there's another thing that's sort of unpopular today. I, one of the words that I just hate, the yeah, concepts I hate, is networking. Right, so we're going to come and we're going to trade business cards. And I'm going to get 50 LinkedIn things after this. I'm like, well, I don't understand what that means. What I think is important, and actually it's funny because now it's kind of in vogue, which it hadn't been all these years, is I believe in relationships. And they're not relationships for a purpose. They're relationships because I like you or because I can help you, I just want to help you, or you just want to help me, or we're working together on a thing. And, um, you know, I get stuff like somebody saw something, or they, you know, they bump into an old friend, and then I'll email the other old people and say, you're not going to believe who I saw today. And that, over time, just solidifies those connections. So I think that it's um, one thing you get, you, one, you know, for better or for worse, I just say what I think, I just am what I am. I don't, right, I would, I've been dressing like this long before it was sort of okay for CEOs to do that. Um, and I think that over time, that's effective. Because people come to see you're not, like I'm really not out to get anything. I just am genuinely, I genuinely care about what you think about whatever, or that you are successful at whatever. And so that maintains relationships over time. So it's not anything that I've done in any way, shape, or form, like intentionally or collected those people. Um, the thing that you see is the foundation of that, of that lattice. Um, and if you guys haven't, if anybody hasn't read about Gore, go read about Gore. It's, an it's really an amazing story and company. Um, is value set, right? So when you look at that peop the set of people who've carried through, it's, it's, there's a core there that's, uh, that's shared. And when you have that um, through time, like really there's only one person, I'm very close to everyone that I've ever been a, uh, done, a, done a company with. 
with, with only one exception. And I mean really close, like, uh, you know, like brothers and sisters kind of close, best friends close. And that comes from the value set, right? And then behaving in accordance with your value set, but not, not prospectively, not because you want something out of that, just because that's how, that's how you live, right? That's sort of who you are, and that's what maintains that over the years. That kind of supports almost the jack of all trades kind of type question where it's relationships that you continue to build up a number of relationships with a number of different people and that kind of makes you almost like the expert person to go to. It does because you can always find somebody or connect to somebody yeah. and you don't have to know yourself. Yeah. You can, if you're connected to somebody who does, that's better. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Andy. Um, my question is where you were talking about um, knowing what you want to do when you're 12, um, and that being part of the culture uh, in the US right now. Um, so can you speak a bit more about that and how you're dealing with that with your own children? Yeah, so it's funny. I was as you were asking that, I was thinking about my children. So um, my older one, Emma, is, is my husband's really smart, and she's really smart. And um, so she was, we were on a uh, whale watching. We go to Cape Cod every summer, and we're on a whale watching expedition when she was five. And they had this wonderful uh, marine biologist there from Woods Hole who's doing the presentation where they had a whale baleen, which is really cool if you've never seen a whale baleen. So she's passing around the whale baleen. And Emma, who's five, is like driven to go up to her to ask her a bunch of questions about the whale baleen after the talk is over. So she's asking. And um, you know, she's sort of this cute little blonde kid. And um, the woman said, oh, said, said to her, and Emma said pro proactively, like, I am going to be a scientist when I grow up. And the, the marine biologist said to her, oh, really? What are, you, what are you going to study? And she said, animals. And she, didn't, she said, oh, what animals? And she said, Emma said, all the animals. And the marine biologist said, um, well, you probably, you know, we had sort of specialized. And Emma, who was five and had just written a whole thing about elephants, looked at her and said, well, I already know all about elephants. <laughs> um, and 15, it's a direct line. She's going to be a scientist. It's really clear she'll be an academic, and that's been clear forever. It's clear to her. She's already, I just took her on a trip because she wants to see Berkeley because she's interested in whatever physics thing they, they do there. So I think in some cases, you have, to, you have to react to the kid, right? And in some cases like that, it's pretty, you know, and even if she changes, that's fine she changes, but she's driven in this way. My younger one, India, is um, incredibly empathetic like incredibly empathetic. As I said earlier, sort of a systems thinker. She has no idea what she wants to do. And so we talk about things in the house like a gap year. I'm really encouraging them both to do a gap year for the little one's sake so you know she sort of gets more perspective on the world for the older one's sake because she's going to be like this her whole life. So could you take a year like and just relax a little bit? Um, so with our kids, I just let them be what they, what they are. My, my older one is um, really difficult, like really, really. It's been since the day she's born. We actually just found out a little less than a year ago why that is, you know, a nerve thing, but um, really difficult. And we said early on, about two, she was about two, and I looked at my husband one day and said, our job is just keep this kid alive. I don't mean that in a funny way, like really seriously, all, like we just have to keep her alive. Anything above that, Maslow's, I like, can't think about anything else. And it ended up being becoming kind of a foundational plank in our philosophy of parenting. It's like, that's our job. Sort of the rest is theirs, right? So we put them in environments that are rich and, and try to get them in places where they can self-actualize. So they've been uh, there in Montessori school for years and all the way through elementary school, things like that. But then you just got to let it be. And as parents, I think, big thing, one of the advantages of having kids who are older, I, I, had, I had the girls at uh, 37 and 40, is they're not me. Right? Whatever they do is whatever they choose to do. I, I don't need a reflection from them. I don't care if they don't want to do sports. Like my older one was actually a really great rock climber. But like, I don't care what you do. It's not, because it's not about me, it's, it's about you. And I think that's the trick and, and what parents don't do. Like the helicoptering and the lawn. Have you guys heard this new one, lawnmower parenting? So helicoptering is remember, as you kind of hover around your kids probably too much. Lawnmowering is you actually go in and eliminate all obstacles for your children, <laughs> um, which is not, not really good for them, right? I'm the mom who lets them fall and just picks them up and goes, you're fine, go, right? So that's sort of the philosophy that I think 
I think ends up creating people who can be more comfortably themselves. I mean, I think that's sort of how I was parented in a different era for different reasons. But like, just you're fine. Go, you're fine. Whatever you're going to do, go do that. David, yeah, two questions for you. One, and you think you might be able to go back to this. You took a company that you only had for six months. You sold for twenty-seven million dollars. Twenty-eight. Don't forget the last million. Uh, okay, twenty-eight million dollars. How did you convince somebody to do that? And then follow on to that. You had a phenomenal run up to that and since that time um, with a lot of these different startups because you did make money in that uh, transaction. Um, were you pushed to or in, uh, and have you had the desire to invest some of your own money in each one of these items? Um, yeah, so um, so the, the Turntide story. So we, where we left that story, we had created this new co and put the $700,000 in it and came over. Um, the it was a combination of right place, just perfect place, perfect timing with a perfect product and a perfect team. It was an amazing experience. So we did things like, so what we did was we grew the team really fast. And there were harrowing moments, like seriously harrowing moments. Um, but we were 35 people within a couple months. Um, we closed very early, very quickly, big accounts. I mentioned a couple of them already. Um, Merck, Edward Jones Brokerage, University of Pennsylvania, Drexel. Um, it was, uh, we were solving a huge pain point. It wasn't simple selling, though. One of the key elements there was this breakthrough we had selling. Because you're talking about a stupid little company in Conshohocken with no clients. And, and we were, a, were a, a router. So we're a physical thing that you had to put in the stream of your network. You go to these places, like, put something in the stream of the network. Uh, Symantec was also, that's sort of how it all happened. Symantec was a, a, not a customer, but a user of the product. So we finally realized, right, because as I said, so at that time, the metric was network traffic was doubling every six months. And so your spam filters and everything were doubling with it. So think about that, literally. You'd buy two, and then another six months, you'd buy, you were at four, and then you were at eight, and then you're at 16, and then you were at 32, two years in. These numbers were insane. Um, so they were pretty motivated to solve the problem. Um, and we knew that that was, an, that was a real true experience, right? It wasn't like a fluffy consumer thing that might or might not explode or something. So we ended up doing free trials which I hate, incidentally. I am, I, I am absolutely opposed to free anything, because um, I think you don't really learn anything from the market if it's free. But in this case, we knew that if they, we went in, they were going to have to double their infrastructure before they could take us out. And so that's how we sold. And it just completely worked. So the way, what, what the actual story behind what happened was we were in, we were, Symantec was using our, our our product, and Symantec, obviously, if you think about it for a second, any of these security companies, they get pounded like nobody else, right? The spammers and every other kind of, of malware just pounds those companies. It's like a point of pride we're going to get through Symantec. So they're really high volumes they're dealing with. And they were looking to buy something in the anti-spam space because it really made a lot of sense for them. Um, and as part of their diligence process, as they got down the path with these companies they were looking at, and they were companies, if people remember, like Ironport and Brightmail, um, the la one of their steps of diligence was they would install the product that they were thinking about buying the company of in their network. And so they'd done a few of these, and they called down to the network to do another one. And our contact, our guy, said, I am not taking the turntide box out again. Every time you guys make me do this, I take the box out, the system's down, we're here all night, we're firefighting, we can't keep up with the volume. And the M&A guy said what? What's turntide? And we got the phone call. Um, I had inherited a banking relationship, an investment banking relationship with the acquisition. It was one of the contracts I had to take. And so we had this banker working for us. and. Um, we got in a huge tiff about this, so he thought that we should ask for five million bucks because we just got by seven hundred. This is all great, and I said I thought we were worth fifty-six million, and I had a whole reason that I thought it was fifty-six million. That wasn't a made-up number. I used those Wharton skills to sort of show how it was fifty-six million, 
And we had a falling out over it, and we ended up having to buy him out of his contract because I didn't want the tail. I didn't want to pay him if there was a deal. So I forget what we paid him, but it was something like 50,000 bucks or something. And his take would have been, you know, five million or, or something. So we got rid of him, and um, I just negotiated it directly. And it was it was really an extraordinary experience. So they came in with five million dollars was the first thing, roughly, and I said, no, I thought it was 56 million. And the M&A guy said, well, I think you're crazy. And I said, that's fine. And this is, I think, one of the really key lessons. I do um, lessons of life is, a, well, I'll come back to that in a second, but don't let me forget it's an important one about negotiating and how you do it. And I just said, OK, well, I, that, that's fine. We were, meanwhile, fundraising. One of the really most fun weeks I've ever had in business is David and I went to go do the Sand Hill Road routine. So people know, right, there's in, on Sand Hill Road out in, um, out in, in the valley, there's literally just buildings of venture capitalists. So you go and you, you literally just jump. We were, getting, we were going down the strip. We were getting term sheets in email before we were getting to the next meeting. So we ended day one. I think we had five term sheets at the end of the first day. You know, so, and these were, these were absolutely top firms. So to us, we, didn't, we, don't, we don't have to sell, right? What's the best alternative? We'll just go grow the company. That's no problem. So once they, the, the Symantec guys kind of got that, we ended up, you know, we negotiated and we ended up at 28. The um, one thing along the line there, you know, I'm such an operator. I just started my DNA. I love to run things. And I got off a phone call, but I am, I am told that I'm, I'm, I'm good at this. Um, I do enjoy it. To me, it's like, it's like sparring, and we'll come back to that. I, I do martial arts. It's, I got off a phone call, and I moved the number. I think it was like 7 or $8 million in a 20-minute phone call. And I hung up and I just looked at my finance guy. I was like, what? there's something wrong in the universe when you can build a whole company and generate revenue and all the rest of this, or you can have a phone call for 20 minutes and generate $8 million, $7 million, or whatever it was. So that's how it happened, was they were, they were part of it. We had the alternative. Um, and we were just sort of hardcore about it. Um, and the hardcore about it goes way back. So I started doing martial arts um, when I was in my early 20s. And the company, that first one I mentioned, uh, I was working for, wanted me to move to New York. And I really wanted to move to New York, but I also really wanted my own place. I had grown up in New York, I wanted to be back, but I just was, I'd had it with the whole roommate thing. So I told them I was making $24,000 a year, um, and I told them I needed to make 48 to agree to move to New York. And they had the same reaction Symantec had, which was like, uh, what? And I said, it's fine, I don't need to, right? That's fine, I don't really need the job, and I'll do whatever, and I don't need to move to New York. And so, Went back and forth. It took like two or three months. And they finally um, gave me the, the 48 to move to New York. And the critical thing in there, which I was very conscious of at the time, and, and now it's just sort of an unconscious thing, is when you're, when you're fighting with someone and when you're sparring uh, and you're first starting, you're tentative. And if you step in, right, if you step in and, and punch yourself, you're, you're opening up, right? You're coming into your opponent. If you don't go 100%, it's all downside, no upside. Because you just came in, you've made yourself completely vulnerable, and you haven't gone. So if you're going to come, there's only one way to come. You're going to come with 100%. And to me, that was just the same thing. Right? Like, I'm not, this isn't a negotiation. We're going to find a thing. Like, that's, the, you either do it or you don't do it. And I'm fine if you don't do it. And so you have to be willing to be, to be vulnerable in that way. In the same way you are when you come full speed, you're making, you're opening yourself to being, to being attacked as well, it's going to make the attack more effective. And, and I've lived that, and I, just, I do that negotiating-wise, the whole thing. So what you're looking for when you're negotiating is what's the overlap of interest? So the 56 million was based on they're going to make money at 56 million. So the question is just, you're going to make money, I'm going to make money. The question is just how that pie is going to get split up. I have alternatives, you have alternatives. But you've got to find a number in there, and I'm trying to get more of it than you are. So being willing to take that strength. And I think women in particular, I mean, all the data shows, what, terrible at this, just terrible. So people haven't seen, right, women tend to ask for less money, get less money, tend to negotiate less hard. They worry about what everybody's going to think. All that bullshit. Just go. Or if you just go. And the reality is the thing, so the one thing I try to always, I, I got my opportunity out. One thing I always try to say to people and talk, people, you know, say, um, you must be risk taker or risk lover or something, entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs. Not at all. Not at all. I think what entrepreneurs do uniquely is they manage risk, is they're not so emotional about it. Most people tend to get really emotional about the risk. 
So the, the thing to be afraid of, right, is, is what happens. What people are afraid of is all the stuff around what happens. So they're worried about not do we get the deal and what's the deal. They worry about what are people going to say about it. What if I do this thing and then I fail? I got to call my mother and my whoever else is going to know that I failed. That's all true, and that's all negative, but that's not what you should be making the decision on, right? So what you have to do is be able, and I think this is what, most, what I can do, what most entrepreneurs do, is we can look at it and assess the risk coldly. Take that emotion, that emotion is part of this decision here. And so I think that's how we got that deal done, was being very real about this is, this is what we want, these are alternatives, and it's fine. I, I literally don't care. So it's the fear itself that ends up <clears throat> screwing things up. Not the thing, but the thing is the problem. So the way I manage that, or the way I learned to manage that, I sort of don't have to anymore so much, is I used to ask myself very specifically, I'm a big visualizer, comes out of my sports background, or is, is using visualization, is imagine the very worst thing that's going to happen. What is the very worst thing that's going to happen? And then I explore that completely. I wallow in it, I live in it, I imagine the conversation, I do the, do the whole thing. You get to the end of that, you know what the answer always is? That's not that, who cares? That's not bad. So why am I hung up and making this decision over here about that? Forget all that stuff. But just sort of denying it doesn't work. Right? Generally you have to go there and live it and sit in it before you can decide, oh, I'm not gonna do I'm not gonna base my life on that, right? I'm gonna do these things. So that's how that happened along with a chance to slip in a couple other points. I'm glad we had this whole thing recorded. Uh, lots of gems in there. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, we're kind of out of time, so I'm going to transition it. And uh, usually people hang out for a while, and I hope you'll hang out for a little bit. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. I know there were more questions. I'm sorry. Uh, but lots of new faces. Thanks for coming, and I hope you, that you come back. Next week, Night Owls. Thursday, there's a special event. If you see some of this content in your social media streams, please share it. And uh, please give Lucinda a round of applause with me.